I'm Ryan Lett for Brown of Fund Calibre. We're joined today by Niall Gallagher, manager of the Gamstar Continental European Equity Fund. Thank you for joining us, Niall. Thank you. Um, now, you're coming up to your 10th anniversary of running the fund. What have been some of the highs and lows over the period? It's been a very interesting 10 years. If I go back to the beginning, um, I took over the fund just as the world was coming out of a global financial crisis. And then as soon as we got beyond that, we were then straight into the Eurozone crisis, which was a series of rolling crises from Greece, Cyprus, then into Portugal, Ireland, Spain, and, and Italy. And then we had Mario Draghi's Whatever It Takes, and then we've had various t uh, taper tantrums, and I guess now we've got the issue of whether the world is going to end up in a trade war. So it's been a very, very interesting 10 years. It's been a 10 years that's been much more macro dominated and much more political, geopolitical dominated than uh, the previous 10 years of my career. I would say the one lesson I've learned, which is a reinforcement, is actually throughout all of this noise, the best thing you can do is just invest in really good companies. Um, businesses with very strong market positions, uh, ideally global, but not always so. Uh, companies with strong margins, good balance sheets, uh, very uh, strong moats around their businesses. If I think of the companies that have done really well over this period, almost irrespective, it's been businesses like Atlas Copco, Hexagon, uh, Kingspan, uh, LVMH. And you know what these businesses have is they tend to be the number one and number two at what they do. They tend to have uh, very, very strong market positions. Uh, they tend to have uh, leading edge research and development, which keeps them ahead of their competitors. They tend to have good margins. They tend to have a philosophy around having strong balance sheets. And all of those things means that they're just going to thrive. And there can be individual years where the company does badly, uh, or maybe we have weak profits one year. But taken over the medium term, these companies tend to compound at high levels of return, and they've done very well. So for me, the key lesson I've learned is actually at the end of the day, with all of the noise, just focus on owning really good companies because those are the ones that in the long term uh, provide the best returns for our clients. And of those companies, you have three sort of categories that, um, that you look for in a company. There's one, disrupting industries, those dominating industries, and those with a deluxe good or service. Are you concerned that those disruptors will start influencing the dominant industries and like, interrupt those incumbents? Yeah, I mean, the, the idea of disruption really is kind of a mental framework we have because we are living in a fairly extraordinary time. Um, whenever uh, I come across people who are bearish, you just have to point out some of the great technological changes and shifts we're witnessing, and also the huge emergence of middle-class spending power uh, in Asia, uh, Latin America, but particularly in, in Asia. And what all of that means is that basically there's a fair amount of change going on. And when we think about our companies, we have to really ask the question, this company has a good position now, but is that position going to be defendable and will it, be, will it be a good position in five years time? Because it could be a business with a very, very strong market position, but technology, technological shifts may be actually causing it to change. So think of some of the great retailers. Uh, along comes uh, the internet, a lot of hype uh, 20 years ago, but now slowly you're beginning to see businesses like Zalando emerge, which is challenging some of the traditional retailers. And of course, Amazon, which is challenging everything. So the answer to your question is yes, you do have to think about businesses that are uh, currently well positioned that might be challenged by some of the uh, more disruptive companies. Um, in our portfolio, we have Zalando, which is an online clothing and footwear uh, retailer. It's a very, very powerful business. It's got 3,000 brands uh, on, the, on the platform. Uh, they've got 300,000 individual clothing and footwear items. They're growing at about 25% a year. They are becoming very attractive for the brands to sign up to because if you are a clothing and footwear company in one country of the EU and somebody offers you pan-European distribution, logistics, and a very good front end in terms of the app to deal with the customers, you're going to take it. So for companies like Inditex, which is the owner of Zara, they have to think very hard about how they deal with Zalando. Do they have the power to compete against them or do they actually... Uh, using the word of Martin Sorrell, become a frenemy, where they are both a competitor and also a, a user of the service. And in the case of that company, we think they have got the balance right. But in the case of other retailers, I think they're going to continue to really struggle. So the answer is yes, we do have to think about how the disrupting businesses will affect some of the uh, other companies we own. And in general, that has led us to prune the portfolio and actually really focus on those types of companies where we think they've got a very strong defendable position, not just now but also in five years' time. Another very good example uh, would be in the auto sector. So we have, obviously, 
uh, a huge environmental, uh, I guess, issue we have to deal with, which is the need to get carbon emissions down. Uh, most likely, the car industry is going to have to get to a position where they're producing a large number of electric cars by the end of the decade. Maybe in some countries they'll have to sell exclusively electric cars. That's going to shake the industry up. We've obviously seen Tesla has come in and it has achieved a huge amount. So for us, uh, we have to think about in our auto holdings, uh, what are the companies that will do well from the change and what are the ones that maybe won't do well? And if we think companies won't do well and they'll get disrupted, we'll have to sell them. So it's, it's a very pertinent question. And you've currently got a lot of positions in Irish companies. Why is this? Um, there are three uh, significant Irish positions in the portfolio, uh, Ryanair, Kingspan and Grafton. I first invested in Grafton in the year 2000. I first invested in Kingspan in 2000 and Ryanair in 2004. So I've owned these companies for a very, very, very long time. Um, I know the management teams well. Uh, I own them because they are individually very good businesses. So if we take Kingspan, which is one of our largest holdings in the fund, uh, Kingspan is a world leader in rigid board insulation. They were the number one when I first invested in them in the UK. They're now the number one in the UK, Germany, France, Spain, uh, Central Europe, number two in the Scandinavian region, the number one in the US, they're the number one in most of Latin America, the number one in India. So they are a company that has really thrived and globalized. And the business is a very good business. They invest very heavily in research and development to keep ahead of their competitors. Uh, they've been very good at growing organically and through acquisition uh, abroad. And this position they have uh, is a very strong one. And then combined with the need to reduce uh, thermal emissions, so carbon usage within buildings, there's a very strong structural headwind, tailwind. So it's a business that I, I like fundamentally, I've owned it for a long time, and the fact that it's Irish is kind of incidental. I would think that probably less than about 2% of the profits come from Ireland. It's really a, a global business. Ryanair, kind of similar, it started off as a legacy Irish company flying between Ireland and the UK. It's now a pan-European airline. Uh, they are the largest short-haul airline in Europe. Uh, the biggest markets are actually UK, Spain and Italy. So it's not really an Irish company. And then Grafton Group, another very old holding. Um, when I first invested in it, it was majority Irish and growing in the UK. Uh, the business is now uh, split between the UK, Ireland and the Netherlands. Uh, the UK is the biggest part. The Netherlands is growing very quickly. The Irish business is recovering. It's not really an Irish company anymore either. So all three of those companies are really either global or pan-European in their scope. So. I guess it's historic, the fact that they were Irish, but they're not really Irish businesses. And I don't think we can have a European manager in at all without asking about Brexit. Um, does it worry you or any of the companies you hold at all? Gosh, I mean, we spent so much time thinking about Brexit. I think like most people, we, we wish it would just go away. Um, it will have some impact, I think, if there is a hard Brexit. We've asked the companies, obviously. We, we've spoken to them. Uh, funny enough, one of our companies has banned discussion of Brexit internally because they don't want the salespeople to have an excuse. They want them to be focused on selling the product, which I thought was quite smart. Um, I think that we, we, we have to assume that if there is a very hard Brexit, so a no-deal Brexit, that the UK could risk a recession. Uh, that will reduce the demand uh, for products in the UK, and that would probably have a knock-on impact on Ryanair. It would probably impact on Grafton. Kingspan uh, say they already have seen quite a big effect in the UK. So... They believe that investment in the UK is down very significantly over the last two years. Uh, so you've already kind of had it. And actually, it's possible that if there is a softer Brexit, maybe there's a pent up demand effect, particularly in areas of construction. So I think that if there is a hard Brexit, it's probably bad. Um, although, you know, we're a long way into this, so maybe it'll be less bad than we think. Uh, whilst I think a softer Brexit or an agreed Brexit or some kind of deal would probably be good and we'll see a bounce. Okay, and what's your outlook generally for Europe? Look, we're fairly sanguine. I mean, it, it's been referred to as the most hated asset class in the world. We've seen huge outflows from Europe. And I read the Merrill Lynch manager survey, fund manager survey yesterday, uh, which was incredibly bearish, uh, particularly on Europe. But the reality is it's just not that bad. Um, you know, the first point to make, which is really kind of key, is that European equities uh, as a whole now derive over half of the revenues and profits from outside of Europe. So about 35 to 40% of the profits of European companies now come from emerging markets. So European equities are increasingly not a brilliant proxy for the European economy. They're driven much by what, more about what goes on in the world as a whole. But even within Europe, the underlying economics are fine. Spain's doing very well. Uh, Germany's still doing quite well. France is doing okay. The Scandinavian region is growing. 
Uh, the Eurozone is probably as a whole growing at or slightly above trend. And the kind of negativity we see in some of the survey data, the PMIs, the ISMs, just doesn't really correlate with what we're seeing uh, from the companies. The companies themselves uh, are reasonably sanguine. Uh, Europe's not booming, according to the companies we invest in, but nor is it in recession. So it's kind of, it's fine. Well, Noah, that's been really interesting. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And for more information on the Gamma Star Continental European Equity Funds, please visit funcaliber.com.